author, columnist, managing editor of LibertyNation.com, podcast host and conservative policy advocate. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. The most important thing President Biden can do during the remainder of his term is resign or retire, at least according to some major new polling, with his numbers way underwater, although not as bad as Vice President Kamala Harris's popularity. It seems that Joe Biden just can't catch a break. The question America is asking, though, is does he even deserve one? There's a saying that goes, if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. Or as British wartime Prime Minister Winston Churchill once said, plans are of little importance, but planning is essential. It seems that this administration is drowning in its own lack of forward planning. In place of strategy, it has opted for showmanship and pretty sweet words. As an energy crisis looms, the president mulls shutting down essential oil pipelines, while at the same time begging OPEC to ramp up output. VP Kamala Harris wanders off to Europe to lecture folks about their immigration crisis, while steadfastly refusing to admit that at least 1.75 million illegal immigrants came across the southern border this year resembling a crisis. What of Mayor Pete Buttigieg, now Transport Secretary, who spends his time discussing racist roads and how best to ensure bridges are high enough to eradicate the dark history of prejudice, all while container ships sit off the coast, unable to supply Americans of all colors with the essential goods they need. This is more than a lack of planning. It represents an inability to think beyond the next, almost certainly disastrous, popularity poll. Welcome to Liberty Nation Radio here on the Radio America Network. I'm your host, Mark Angelides. Now, on today's show, we're going to town on the future of the Republic under Joe Biden, fading popularity and all, and in what direction is the land of the free heading? I'd like to say a special hello to our listeners on KNTR 106.3 FM out of Lake Havasu City, Arizona. We appreciate you. Remember, this show is proudly sponsored by LibertyNation.com, where you can access podcasts, breaking news and analysis, and a range of biting and brilliant shows to whet your appetite for freedom and your fondness for the great American Constitution. Let's get started. In politics, it's all too easy to get caught up in the day-to-day minutiae while ignoring the grander scale trends that seem to be emerging. Our 24-hour news cycle feeds on the new news and disregards the big picture in favor of pre-packaged sound bites and salacious headlines. But are we missing the woods for the trees? Well, one such fellow has always been able to see through the morass and brings much-needed perspective is nationally syndicated columnist and prolific author, Mr. Cal Thomas, who once again joins us to dive deep into the reality facing Americans and American politics. Thanks for being here, Cal. Always a pleasure, Mark. Thank you. So, Cal, the latest polling, it shows uh, Joe Biden's approval is in deep water, and even a majority of Americans don't think he's in control of his own presidency. Now, we have three more years of President Joe ahead of us. What kind of impact do you think this distrust that the top politician in the country will have on the psyche of the American voter? Well, as you indicate, the uh, poll numbers have been falling consistently since he was inaugurated. Uh, A lot of this, of course, is uh, the reaction to Donald Trump, who a great number of people didn't like because of his personality that overwhelmed his policies. I think the real problem in the United States, Mark, and it may be a, a problem in other Western countries too, but especially here, is that people don't realize that a constitutional republic has to be renewed every generation or we risk losing it. People don't take the time to actually look into issues and solutions that have worked in the past, update them as necessary and move on to the future. They're lazy. It's like uh, watching an exercise video thinking you can get in shape instead of actually going to the gym or running. Uh, you can't you can't let somebody else do it for you. You have to do it for yourself. As we've seen in our American public schools, the teaching of civics has almost disappeared. People don't understand or even read or know what's in the Constitution. Uh, this is very, very dangerous. And so they vote on feelings or party loyalty or other factors that have absolutely nothing to do with uh, the issues at hand. I've been going through some past columns of mine, and as I'm writing a book on my nearly 40 years as a syndicated columnist, and I'm looking at comments uh, from politicians of the past, they're all recycled. They say the same thing. The rich need to pay their fair share. Nobody ever talks about 
personal responsibility. It's all about the politicians and about the government. And that is why we are in trouble with uh, an absent border, uh, with people who are absent from the political system, and people who have checked out on things that really matter in favor of envy, greed, and entitlement, and what I can get for myself from the government. Yeah, it's uh, Ecclesiastes, I believe, isn't it? Uh, all, there's nothing new under the sun, and all this has happened before. And right. as you point out, there are no new solutions, which is a question that's... Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because that actually brings me to a question that I have for you later on that uh, should be interesting to do with Athenian democracy and how it pertains to today. But my, my next question is, we see with Joe Biden, he's, he's put activists in charge in just about every uh, position of importance. And we know that uh, activists, they're willing to achieve their pet goals by pretty much any means necessary. All must fall before the greater good of their cause. Um, even to the point of trashing the Constitution. Now, that's how and why they're activists. Now, is this a, a wholesale decimation of the institutions that cobbled together create w what we call the United States? Um, and is this being done with purpose, do you think? Oh, absolutely. I don't think there's any question. Uh, Biden has been kind of a reverse Trojan horse. Uh, he is occupied mentally and in every other way uh, by the hardcore left. The hardcore left in America knows it can't win elections on its own. So it puts up people like Barack Obama and to a certain extent, Bill Clinton and other Democrats running for Congress with a few exceptions like Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, who are openly socialist. Uh, the, and, and they try to push these through as moderates. You hear in the American media all the time the word moderate. Joe Manchin is a moderate. Uh, one or two others are moderates, but you never hear the media defining that. What does that mean? Just spending maybe a half a trillion dollars less than the other guys? Uh, they're still pro-choice on abortion. Marry anybody you want uh, or as many people as you want. Uh, truth is no longer objective. It's subjective. It's whatever I think. If you think something different, it's okay as long as it makes you happy. So, uh, you know, we've abandoned Thomas Jefferson, who's about to be thrown out of the New York City Council chambers, by the way, because he owned slaves, uh, who spoke of um, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident. That whole philosophy has evaporated in America today. Uh, there is no objective truth. And that's why I think whether it's immigration or virtually anything else, including spending and the debt, you know, the Democrats used to be against the debt. They say we're imposing something on our grandchildren that cannot be sustainable, but now they're fine with it. So what changed? Did their grandchildren change? Did economic uh, reality change? No, only they changed. And they know the more people they addict to so-called benefits, which are jammed into this new so-called infrastructure and social spending legislation that is now being debated in Congress, the more they get uh, addicted to government, the more they can rely on votes to perpetuate their careers in office. And that's what it's really all about. Well, yeah, you never uh, vote to get rid of the guy who's giving you money. There you go. That's the reality of it. So let's go to the longer term here, Cal. Where do you see the political landscape by 2024? Now, I'm not just talking about who wins or who loses elections, but the state of the body politic. Well, I think a lot of it depends on what happens in the congressional races next year. If the Republicans run on stopping the socialist train, if they run on with superior ideas, you know, the late Jack Kemp had a great line. He said, uh, you don't beat a thesis with an antithesis, you beat it with a better thesis. That's why Ronald Reagan's great line, are you better off than you were four years ago, resonated with so many people. People see the cost of petrol, of eggs, of bread, of virtually everything going up, a consequence of inflation and deficit spending and huge national debt. So they're feeling this at the most personal of levels, at the supermarket, at the uh, petrol pump, at virtually every other area that touches every life in America. So I think if Republicans can make this case, which is an obvious case, uh, they will do very well next year. And then in 2024, of course, it all depends on what Donald Trump does. He is the, uh, the key factor. If he runs, I think he's going to divide the party. Uh, I can't imagine that he won't run if he remains in decent health. But uh, 
There are plenty of others out there. Ron DeSantis has done a fabulous job as governor of uh, Florida, which is one of the reasons the left continues to beat up on him. Mike Pence, I think, has uh, got the whole package, but unfortunately, he's so tied to Trump, I don't know if he can uh, escape that association. But he believes in everything Trump did on policies. He just has a completely different personality. He would be my ideal candidate. And then anybody can surface in the next uh, two years and probably will. You're listening to Liberty Nation Radio. Later in the show, we're going for a deep dive on Biden's falling numbers and what it means in real terms. But right after this short break, we're back with national treasurer and widely syndicated columnist Cal Thomas. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. All right, Cal, we see a lot of uh, folks in the Democratic Party that they're stepping down uh, ahead of the 2022 congressional elections. Um, Most of these are are safe seats, of course, so there's no major issue for the the Democrats here. But I think, and I I guess many other people also think that the way this administration is going, relying on the strictly party line votes that they have been so far to get pretty much anything done, that we're going to see a lot more folks from both parties step down in the near future because most of these, these people, they didn't get into politics to spend their time in in constant bickering and competition, having to, let's call it, throw away the, the last of their remaining principles to bolster a party. Um, they went to DC to work for their constituents and, well, and to get rich. Just kidding, yeah. sort of. Um, <laughs> what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's true. Uh, how, I wrote recently, how do some of these people come to Washington as thousandaires and leave millionaires when they're getting a salary of roughly $175,000 a year? Uh, it's, uh, you know, you got lobbyists in there with free things and free uh, food and travel and all sorts of other things. Uh, it's corrupting. I mean, there was a columnist years ago, uh, Jack Anderson, who wrote a, uh, a column called The Washington Merry-Go-Round. And then there was another columnist that uh, uh, talked about um, oh, there was Potomac. Uh, something. Anyway, you know, t- Trump t- touched on this when he spoke about the swamp. And it is a swamp and it is corrupting uh, because as soon as you get there, you have to start raising money for your next campaign and you sell off pieces of your soul to various interest groups uh, to do that. It's incredibly corrupting. This is why the founders never expected uh, politics to be a career. They had their people coming from their law offices, from businesses, from farms to serve their country for a limited time. George Washington being the model for that. He could have run for a third term, but he went home to Mount Vernon, could have easily won. And uh, uh, they didn't expect these guys to become career politicians. This is why term limits are so necessary. I may have told you this story before. George McGovern, 1972 presidential candidate in the Democrat ticket, friend of mine, uh, senator from South Dakota, um, lost in the Reagan landslide of 1980 and decided to do something totally different, went up to Connecticut and bought an inn and tried to run it. It went bankrupt after a couple of years and uh, the Wall Street Journal called him up, want to know what happened. And then the only thing you need to know about what happens to politicians when they stay too long in Washington, George McGovern said, gee, if I'd known how difficult it was to run a business, I might have voted differently in the Senate. And that says all you need to know about people who stay too long in Washington. Right, that brings us nicely onto uh, the the question that that I I referred to earlier. So I want to take a, a little step back in time. Now, as you know, when uh, ancient Athens sort of came into its own, first through the reforms of uh, Solon, and then I think it was uh, Clisthenes, uh, who became known as the the father of Athenian democracy. Now, that was considered this grand experiment, one that sought to give each household in the city-state a voice. And here's the thing, the laws, they were written in plain language in public squares, Mm -hmm. so that every man, woman, and child, those who knew their letters, could read and understand them. And today we have a constitution and a bill of rights that, that I find quite interesting and easy to read. It, it's, it's, very, it's very simple. It lays out what th- this, is, this is what things should be and these are what your rights are and this is how they're protected. Um, but it seems that now it requires an army of lawyers and politicians to explain the subtleties and to argue over the subtleties of why rights that we thought were enshrined they're just not, that's just not so. Um, and it seems that America is straying very much from this Athenian and, and uh, of course, the Roman influence faster day by day. Uh, 
So how do we stop the piecemeal destruction of the nation's founding documents? Well, again, it goes back to education and what is being taught in our schools and the next generation of people who are going to lead this country or, or any Western country for that matter. You mentioned the Greeks, uh, John Knox, the founders of this country, all believe that power flowed from the people and that government was instituted among men and women uh, for the purposes of promoting the general welfare not the individual welfare of politicians. But today, especially in the United States, power is seen as coming from the top. You look at these vaccine mandates. You look at these federal regulations everywhere. You take an airplane ride. There's 10 minutes of safety and federal regulation announcements, including not messing with a smoke detector in the bathroom, keeping your mask on at all times, unless you are sipping a drink or eating food, and then you're supposed to replace the mask while you're swallowing, I guess. Uh, nobody says, well, has, if the virus is there and sees you drinking and eating, is it not going to invade your body? It's all theater. It's manufactured by government elites who want to increasingly have control of our lives and individual decisions. This is completely contrary to the Constitution. We have a 10th Amendment for a purpose, and it says, as I'm paraphrasing, all rights not specifically granted to the federal government shall be reserved for the individual states and for the people. That is completely ignored now. Bob Dole, a former senator and presidential candidate, used to carry that 10th Amendment around in his pocket and remind people of it. But now with the government being, serving like an ATM, uh, doling out goodies to everybody, entitlements, benefits, you hear them on the commercials. We have open season now on uh, Medicare. And the television stations and networks are flooded with Medicare supplement ads. Every single one of them contains the words entitled and benefit. And those are code words for envy, greed, and entitlement. I deserve things. Oh, that's the other word, deserve. I deserve the benefit and the entitlement, the unholy trinity. Uh, yeah, with the flight, um, I, I avoid the, uh, the issue with um, removing the mask because I, I drink Bloody Marys constantly all throughout <laughs> the entire, it doesn't matter how long the flight is. That's good. Because that's good. it's the tomato juice. It's, it's better for you because the, uh, you get the flavor because there's a difference there in flavor taste when you're uh, I'm with you. altitude. I'm with you. That's good. Cal Thomas, <laughs> we'll leave it on that. Thank you ever so much for joining me. Thank you, Mark. You're listening to Liberty Nation Radio, heard across the Radio America network from our flagship station in the nation's capital, WWRC in Washington, D.C. And remember, you can tune in for Liberty Nation Radio from 2 to 3 p.m. Sunday on KBKW, 103.5 FM, 1450 AM, the talk of Grays Harbor. Coming up soon on the show, we'll be talking liberty and dissecting the crowd crusher Travis Scott's Astro World Festival. But next up, we're meeting Tim Donner to figure out how Biden's numbers went from bad to worse. Don't touch that dial. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. The numbers are in and they don't bode well for President Joe Biden. This most precipitous fall in popularity, not only for his job approval, but for his handling of just about every issue. And yet we have three long years ahead. Well, to paint a picture of what that particular dark winter might look like, we're joined by longtime host of this here Liberty Nation Radio and senior political analyst for LibertyNation.com, Mr. Tim Donner. Welcome back, Tim. Always a pleasure, Mark. Now, I have to say, I'm stunned by how this turned around so quickly. Um, us political pundits, we, we knew it would be bad, but I think we're experiencing a case of political whiplash here. How bad is it for President Biden? Well, it sounds like you're setting me up for a Johnny Carson. How bad is it? A uh, late night talk show. Well, it's so bad, Mark, that my, uh, Joe Biden may not even be aware of it, which is a problem that's only going to get worse because his cognitive decline becomes more obvious with each passing day. And unfortunately, the physical ills, the inability to, say, shall we say, control his bodily functions is now even an issue. So 
it is it has fallen apart for this presidency faster than I even imagined. And I imagined it would fall apart pretty fast uh, because he seems not at all in control of what's going on in his administration. He's unable to navigate a 50 50 Senate. He's unable to navigate a narrow majority in the House. And I think his biggest problem just in terms of politically, Mark, is that he sided with the progressives after being elected as a moderate. So he's, he's picked the wrong horse, and it's obvious, even with this reconciliation bill that's eventually going to pass, it's not going to be anything near what he had hoped in his somehow utopian thought that Americans were going to embrace socialism. They're not. Yeah, I think one of the things that a lot of people missed was in a, a fairly recent TV appearance, he was uh, explaining that, and I quote, I'm a capitalist. Now, a capitalist, uh, as we know, that, that's a term used by the people who oppose capitalism. Yes. Uh, <laughs> rather, he should, he should, if, if he actually meant it, he should have said, I'm a free marketeer, or I believe in the free market. So I think that actually, um, the, as you point out, the side that he sided with, the progressives, uh, I think they took that as a challenge and uh, are planning on crucifying him for. Uh, well, he gave them he gave the them the word. rope. I mean, he encouraged them. He encouraged them to hold out and pass the bipartisan uh, infrastructure bill. Uh, he should have pushed them to pass it before the 2021 election. Who passes a bill, a popular bill? a bipartisan bill one day or two days after an election. That is political malpractice to, an, to a stunning degree. And a lot of it is Biden's responsibility because he's the party leader. And even if he's a doddering old fool, like a lot of us think he is, he is the president and he's the one that's got to make it happen. And he's just not doing it. Yeah, it's. Um, I guess a lot of the moderates they're they're campaigning more on on issues, well, planning to campaign more on issues going into twenty twenty two rather than uh, relying on we are Democrats, please reelect us. So, what right. do the numbers tell us about those issues? I mean, it's notable in the aftermath of the election that you had the fourth estate allies telling the public that the adults were back in charge. That's what the legacy media thinks, but what do the American people think? Well. There was a very revealing poll from Harris, old time pollster Gallup and Harris are probably the two oldest pollsters in the country. But the interesting part of it was not so much Biden's numbers now because they're all all underwater. The interesting thing was the contrast to Donald Trump's numbers in his last month in office. So remember that Trump had lost the election. His behavior had been extremely controversial. We had January 6th, which has been still being investigated. Uh, it was a horror show. And yet you look at the numbers across the board comparing Trump in his last waning days of his presidency to Biden, and they're way up from where Biden stands now, 16 points lower is Biden on the economy. He is 14 points lower on, uh, on job creation. I'm reading these off so I get them correct. He's uh, 13 points lower on foreign affairs, 16 points lower on fighting terrorism, 17 points lower on immigration. And here's the part, Mark, that's really shocking. He's seven points lower on the very thing that Biden apologist said was the reason to put him in for the bumbling, incompetent Donald Trump was his competence. The fact that he's been a politician for 50 years and he's seven points lower on the single issue, which you would think most people that voted for Biden uh, voted on. And he's seven points down there. So it's across the board a disaster. And I don't know, the next time we see Donald Trump saying, miss me yet? Apparently, <laughs> all the voters answering these polls miss his presidency, if not his person. Yeah, there's been much uh, analysis uh, given in the, the wake of the stunning Virginia defeat. And to a lesser extent, on the, the rising red tide in New Jersey. Now, 
do you think that uh, I mean this a lot of people are calling this uh, like a semi red wave or, or the, the the burgeoning start of a red wave now do you think that Joe Biden is the illness that's causing this or is he just a symptom of a larger problem within uh, the Washington DC swamp well, I think the the radicals were allowed to run loose in this party in 2020. And I think because they won the election, they somehow thought that people want socialism and they don't object to the kind of insurrection, the real insurrection that we saw in the summer of 2020 when one city after another was taken over by radical Antifa activists and the like. Uh, they have gone forward somehow assuming that because Trump was not reelected, that means the country wants the opposite of Trump, which is pure, unadulterated socialism. OK, European style more than Venezuelan style, but socialism nonetheless. They want it to be another Western Europe. That's what they want. So the fundamental premise that they are operating on is flawed, which is that the country is either center left or flat out left. And that just isn't true. The country is center, center right. And they, they're not comfortable with the radicals who seem to have uh, taken charge of the Democratic Party. Even if AOC and the Progressive Caucus appear to be a minority, they are acting and they're being treated as if they're a majority. And you cannot tell me that more than 15, maybe 20 percent of most of the American people are comfortable with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez being in a position of power or authority. So I think it's a fundamental problem. And Biden, Biden's problem is that he's the best that the Democratic Party could do. And well, everybody. That, yeah, that leads me nicely on to my final question for you, Tim. Now, you and I, we've discussed this before off camera. But it seems to me that uh, Democrats, they're scrambling for a viable 2024 contender. Now, Kamala Harris uh, is shockingly even more unpopular than her boss. I, I believe it's 28 percent approval rating. So who's left? Who will be on the, the Democrat 2024 ticket? Uh, and don't tell me it's uh, Republican Adam Kinzinger. <laughs> well, it could be. could be. I mean, because look, they look through the field of all Democrats in the entire country, including the 29, 29 who announced for the presidency in 2020. And the best they could come up with was Joe Biden, who 10 months into his presidency is at 38 percent approval, three separate polls. He's in the 30s. And Kamala Harris, who's 10 points lower than that. And all the other prospective Democrats, frankly, either disgraced themselves or gave a not ready for prime time performance in 2020, which lowers uh, the number of potential candidates even that much further. I'll just say, Mark, if I had to guess, to me, the front runner in 2024 is going to be Gavin Newsom, because I believe he was strengthened by the recall effort in California, which he which he fended off easily. And I think in the in the tradition of that which does not kill me makes me stronger. I think Newsom, he's attractive, he's articulate, he's been wanting the presidency from the moment he entered public life. If I had to guess right now, I'm going with Gavin Newsom. Tim Donner, thank you ever so much. Always a pleasure, Mark. Lawsuits are plenty against Travis Scott and the Astro World Music Festival. What happened and how will it play out in the courts? We'll be right back. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. The tragic deaths of eight people and hundreds of injuries at the Astroworld Music Festival shocked the nation. Travis Scott, the performer, has come under the spotlight accused of performing while people were involved in a crush. And the legal consequences, the lawsuits, they have begun. Now, what kind of liability could Mr. Scott face? And does this have broader ramifications for performers in the future? Well, to answer these legal questions, we're joined by constitutional lawyer and host of the excellent Uprising podcast, Mr. Scott D. Cosenza. Thanks for and taking music the time, fan, Scott. Mark. And music fan, a fan <laughs> of Mr. Scott's. And co concert goer as well, yes. So, Scott, who's liable in this? What are the actions that provoke liability? 
Well, you know, there's a massive amount of attention focused on Travis Scott because he's the most famous or one of the most famous uh, people there. But there is also the venue owner and the uh, promoter of, of the show is usually how these things work, Mark. So if you or I wanted to rent out uh, a stadium or, or arena for a venue, it's not like they just say, OK, we'll take the check and they hand over the keys. There's all sorts of liability protections that are required by uh, a venue owner including not only private security staff, but coordination often with state and municipal authorities for a venue of that size and a crowd that size. Then there's the promoter. Almost all of these events have a promoter who, who is a local, who operates locally, okay? Um, and, and they're in charge of actually dealing with the venue itself uh, and selling the tickets and then sort of turning that over to uh, the artist's organization, which may be a corporate promoter. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, you know, trending now in the United States, I assume internationally, this is true. Uh, but that instead of artists uh, going on their own tour, that the, the, they or their label, their record label would uh, promote, it would be like the LibertyNation.com, uh, you know, rap festival tour 2021. And, and so uh, featuring, you know, Travis Scott or Drake or such and thus. And so those people may also be liable. And then finally, we have the artists themselves, in this case, Mr. Scott and his potential liability. Okay, so is it normal that people take legal actions against uh, performers or venues or promoters um, when people get hurt at concerts? So surely things like crushes in the crowd, these are as old as rock and roll itself. Well, that's certainly true. However, uh, it is common if the allegations involve uh, liability for the way that the venue was set up or the way that the show uh, was designed and whether that aided or retarded the, uh, the damage. And so what we had, uh, Mark, for a long time in the United States was that mosh, that, that sort of the, the pit, uh, if you call it at the front of the shows, this is more common in, in uh, <clears throat> heavy, heavy, uh, metal type shows, uh, they were done away with because of liability in the courts that was assigned to artists and promoters uh, when they basically said, well, you know, this is sort of how the law works. If you know that there's a high likelihood of a pit developing or a crush developing and you do nothing about it, well, the first time it happens, maybe you're okay in terms of liability, meaning the first time in the country that this happens. But if it happens time after time and you don't do anything about it, well, then you may certainly incur liability. If I was advising somebody uh, who was a concert promoter, I would certainly say you better take steps to manage this because it's a foreseeable problem. Uh, we don't have to protect against unforeseeable problems, like if an airplane came in and crashed in the crowd. But for this kind of thing, it is eminently foreseeable and therefore I think we're going to see a lot of liability there. If this is like the uh, Full Lawyer Employment Act of 2021, Mark, uh, this, uh, this incident. No job left behind. So now that the floodgates have opened on the lawsuits here, will this impact people being willing to put on shows or have their names associated with shows? I mean, uh, artists and performers, they can, they can just ditch the touring and they can make their money from album sales or downloads. So artists, are they going to be willing to put themselves in front of this kind of fire? Now it's different of course, for uh, venues and promoters and labels, as you say. Um, but is this going to impact how people access their entertainment? Well, that is the design of the law. And what I mean by that Mark is when these people sue, they'll be suing for, Compensatory damages, but punitive damages is what they would be hoping to get. Now, punitive damages are damages designed to punish the person for their civil wrongdoing so that others may take heed and not do the same thing. So that's the precise design of the law, right? It's, it's to, to, to say, oh, well, if Travis Scott got, uh, you know, had to pay gazillions of dollars, I better not do this if I'm performer X. Okay. And that is how that's my rap name now. Um, so that is by design, what should happen now, what, what would happen, I think in effect, Mark is what has happened in the past, which is that the concerts are designed to prevent that. So for instance, in this case, there was a massive crush forward to the stage, as I understand it, to get closer to the stage. So what we have happened in many concerts, and I don't know why it wasn't in place here is 
there are robust barriers in place to prevent that from happening. Now, certainly some person with acrobatic skill might be able to scale you know, even the tallest fence, but there are ways to prevent almost every you know normal sort of person from from getting that far forward and that's what uh, a lot of venues do when they expect this kind of a thing so it would prevent uh this kind of crush because there were the maximum amount of people uh couldn't get close to the stage to kind of enact the crush if you will yeah there's been actually a, a lot of uh experts who, who are experts in in crowd crushes and and crowd size management that th th these are roles that i wasn't aware specifically existed obviously i was aware that risk management people existed but crowd crush management experts and they're saying that uh literally almost all concerts now have various things that they can be doing better now uh, are these experts who really nobody had really heard of beforehand are they about to become the uh the, the blazing faces of the media's coverage we got to get our resumes polished, Mark, for uh, a crowd management uh, consultant. Well, this is an important thing. If you're going to put on an event with uh, many, many thousands of people, managing those, those, those people safely uh, is incumbent upon you if you're the organizer. So um, I guess those, th those folks, uh, yacht dealers, are going to be uh, th the benefit of uh, some good sales coming up. So tell me, in this instance, what is Mr. Scott's specific liability? Well, that's a complicated question, Mark. It's com confounded by a couple of things. Number one is he seems to have a history, uh, a public history through Twitter and, and social media of um, encouraging people to violate the safety precautions that have been established at his shows, encouraging people to jump on the stage, uh, encouraging people to jump over barriers and it remains to be seen whether he did so uh, on the night in question in, in ways that, you know, uh, basically helped further the carnage. Uh, we know that he didn't stop the show amid pleas to stop the show. Now, what we don't yet know, Mark, is if he processed those as pleas to stop the show. You can imagine if you're on stage in front of, uh, you know, so many dozens and dozens of thousands of people and some small universe of those people are screaming at you to do one thing, whether you're processing it as that thing, we just don't know. Perhaps he did. There are likely to be statements that he made to other people as he got off the, the stage that, you know, are going to come out in court and we'll learn about that. And if he did at the time know that there was, you know, all these emergency incidents happening and he didn't do anything about it, well, then I think the liability uh, would, would definitely apply. But all that's going to have to to wait. You know, we're going to be, for better or worse, talking about this for years to come. I think because of uh, of all the legal action that that will uh, that will result, and the world of concert going will change, and we'll all be at home in the metaverse watching things online. Scott D. Casenza, thank you ever so much. Thanks, Mark. And that's about it for this week on Liberty Nation Radio. I want to thank our guest, the illustrious Cal Thomas, the fount of knowledge in all things political, Tim Donner. And of course, our constitutional connoisseur, Scott Casenza. And most of all, as always, my sincerest thanks to you, the listener, for being here. A final thought before we part. As Margaret Oliphant wrote in The Rector in 1863, he was highly spoken of, everybody knew, but nobody knew who had spoken highly of him. If that reminds you of the current president, it's because as the weeks and months pass, Joe Biden appears more a confection of media myths added to his own muddled personal history. Is it any wonder the American people have decided it's high time for a change? Thanks for listening. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. Who are we? We are Americans that believe in liberty. We are a project of the nonprofit One Generation Away. We are patriots who apply the founding principles to the issues of today. And they keep moving the goalposts on us. We are educators and commentators who love America and the Constitution. Who are we? We are Liberty Nation.